So this is the second part of our renal physiology class, and uh, I'm going. I did talk about uh, about uh, yeah, the, the glomerular filtration in the first class. So I will be talking about uh, proximal convoluted tubule. What really happens over here? What is the reabsorption known as, and what is secretion? Of because reabsorption or secretion will be happening in the proximal convoluted tubule. What is the loop of Henle? What is the counter current mechanism over? Over here in very short and the uh, uh, collecting duct what is happens over there so let me come to so this is suppose this is the uh, bowman space the uh, this is the caps this is the glomerulus and this is the proximal convoluted tubule now what really happens is we have sodium we have potassium and uh, we have other substances like glucose some amount of uh, amino acids and hemo this is a small protein called hemoglobin these are filtered from the glomerular space and they go to proximal convoluted tubule now what really happens whenever there is a proximal convoluted obviously and with water also now remember Remember, my dear friend, is all this proximal convoluted tubule will have what is known as a basolateral cells. Okay, these are basically the side lateral cells. Okay, what really happens is there will be a sodium potassium exchange, sodium potassium exchange in the outer layer of the basolateral membrane because over here you will have the peritubular capillaries, which will are containing the blood. So basically, if you have this uh, nephron like this, uh, this is we're talking about cortical nephrons, you will have a peritubular capillaries. But all this 15% of nephrons, as we have talked about, are basically juxtamedullary. These are encompassing part of the cortex and also going deep into the medulla as well. These are basically long loops. The loop of Henle is long. The loop of Henle is short in cortical nephrons. The loop of Henle is long in juxtamedullary nephrons. Over here, we the, we have the vessel system is known as the vasa recta, and the vasa recta basically contains very sluggishly moving blood, and this all constitute the counter current mechanism, which I will coming in later. Very short, when we talk about basolateral cells of the proximal convoluted tubules, what really happens is there is sodium out uh, in, within the cell to this, uh, this thing, into the, into the blood vessels in exchange of potassium. And this basically is a ATP dependent active transport. Because we have less amount of cells within the with less of a sodium within the cell, sodium will move from the proximal convoluted tubule towards the cell and then outside. And along the, with sodium, we will have dragging of other substances as well, which includes glucose and other substances like amino acids and uh, some amount of chloride and all these things. Most important because the there is obligation of the water to follow sodium, we have obligatory reabsorption of H2O or water along with sodium. So we have 65% reabsorption. Reabsorption why absorption because of filtration. Now they are reabsorbed back. 65% of sodium, 65% of water is basically reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tube. Along with potassium, along with along with uh, other substances like chloride and uh, um, glucose and all this all this stuff, they get reabsorbed in very short. I'm not going to detail. Now again, on the other side, obviously we have basolateral membrane. What really happens over here is there is again there is some peritubular capillaries. From here we'll have carbon dioxide which will diffuse inside this uh, basolateral membrane. Carbon dioxide will bind with the water content of the cell to form bicarbonic acid, H2CO3. Okay, so H2CO3 by an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. Now, H2CO3, this is happening within this, this is the cell. H2CO3 is very unstable. It will again disintegrate into H plus and bicarbonate. Now, what will happen right now? Also, by uh, also, what will happen right now is this H plus will go outside inside this tubule, proximal convoluted tubule from the cells, which will combine with carbon dioxide and to form H two CO then go outside. Okay, but this bicarbonate which has been inside 
will be pumped back inside the uh, peritubular capillary. So there is loss of H plus outside, it goes outside within the capillary, uh, within, the, within the proximal convertible and bicarbonate by some mechanism, as you find there's bicarbonate is being produced, they will be reabsorbed back, reabsorbed back into. The what will happen is this, when this comes now, when this H plus comes, a proton comes within the peritubular capillaries, uh, within the, I'm sorry, proximal convert tubule, it will combine with the bicarbonate ion over here within the proximal convert tubule and form H2CO3 over here. Here, H2CO3 is the unstable compound. It will break into CO2 and H2O and they will, they will be uh, sent off by the effluent. So this is what happens in a proximal convert tubule, all this reabsorption. Some amount of tubular secretion happens because of there are some materials like urea, there will be some drugs like penicillin, penicillin, cephalosporins, even methotrexate, and some waste products will be actively secreted into this tubular lumen. So up to this is the proximal convoluted tubule. Now I will be coming to a very controversial, very complicated topic, which is known as the counter current mechanism. Okay, I will be trying to be as brief as possible and I will I will try to make a detailed lecture but this is basically a basic of uh, renal physiology so I will be as try to be very basic and very skeletal uh, about counter current mechanism okay so what really happens in counter current mechanism let me draw the diagram very confusing because I often get uh, myself I get confused every now and then so okay, my dear friend. Okay. So this is the loop of Henley. Okay, this is a loop of Henley. This is a thin limb. Or this is the descending loop. This is the loop, and this is the ascending loop. Ascending loop is there are two parts. One is a thin loop of thin ascending loop of and thick ascending loop of Henley. Basically, what this is present in juxtapetillary nephrons. What over here is there is this. Uh, try to understand very important this thing. This layer, this, this thin ascending limb, the descending limb is permeable only to water. Ascending limb is permeable only to solutes. What is solute? Sodium and chloride, nothing else. So what really happens is solute uh, means sodium and chloride will go out of this ascending limb into the interstitium. Now, what we know is that the osmolality, what is osmolality is the concentration of a solid within the solvent. So osmolality of blood is around 300 milliosmol per liter. Now it's a plus. So osmolality of the uh, infiltrate is around again 300 milliosmol. Now with reabsorption, again, because 95%, uh, 65 percent of sodium is reabsorbed, 65 percent is water is obligatory reabsorbed, it becomes around 300. Now, as you can understand, it may be 300 over here when this uh, when this filtrate enters after reabsorption, after uh, tubular secretion into that descending limb of Henle. Because, because now think about of the exit first, exit first, because it exited, because it happened in the past. Because the electrolytes had exited, because there is mineral rich interstitium, mallory interstitium, the osmolarity will be increased slowly, okay? Because it has been found that the osmolarity will be increased is 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, like this. Because it goes in like this, because the reabsorption happens like this, okay? Because this is a salty environment, what will happen? The water, because of, the, of this osmosis uh, concept, the water will try to move out of this tubules to equilibrate the salty environment in the interstitium. So the water will move out. So ultimately what will happen, try to understand this, this what I said at 200, 300, 400, you may be saying why from above downwards, why not from below up plus? Because that is happening now. This was passed, happened uh, uh, one hour ago, this is happening now. Because the water is being reabsorbed, the water is being reabsorbed slowly the concentration of the solute is increasing. So it's plus to 300 to start with, 400, 500, 600, 700, like that, goes to the loop, then going up, then going up. 
understand so you can understand now this becomes a very concentrated fluid within the loop this is the distal most part of the loop of the heli within the within the interior of the medulla very simple the water is going out the solute is being uh, be considered within the fluid because this area that the, the descending limb of lehenli as i said is impermeable to solutes so solute concentration increases all this concept the osmolarity increases and then it goes up 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 and again the salt goes up salt goes up sodium goes up chloride goes out sodium goes out chloride goes up and ultimately the osmolarity also decreases so to maintain all this so it happens as a exchange maker it happens as a multiplier maker what is the multiplier the thing happens it becomes compounded by the next flow of the urine through the convoluted tubes you can understand that so it multiplies the concentration multiplies but if you if you go on multiplying then what will happen it will just the, the thing will shut down to maintain the counter current mechanism we have the vasa recta these are the blood vessels which are surrounding the juxtamedullary nephrons which contains sluggish amount of blood sluggishly flowing blood this is a lazy blood why it has to see now whenever there is water more what will try to maintain the interstitium properly intact it will release some solutes also whenever the solute more it will release some water fluid also so this is a counter current exchange which is made by the vasa recta which maintains the counter current mechanism this is a very short this is what i can explain you in very short in this video this is all about the loop of henle now what happens over here when it reaches the collecting or the distal convoluted tubule then you will have because there's a lot of sodium being lost from the descending limb of uh, ascending limb of henle the the osmolarity will be around less than 3 it will be around 200 so there will be a lot of watery fluid within the distal convoluted tube which we do not want when it goes to uh, the collecting duct what will happen then there will be a lot of dilute urine will be excreted here in herein lies the effect of the water being reabsorbed back actively now water goes out by some channels which are known as the aquaporin channels okay this is a type of aquaporin type 1 channels in the descending limb of henle and these are aquaporin type 2 channels in the distal convoluted tube and some part of the collecting duct which are is under the effect of the anti diuretic hormone so the water is also reabsorbed and we have a concentrated amount of a fluid which goes to the collecting duct and then goes over so this is in basis very very brief about the renal physiology one thing before i end today's lecture is let me tell you what is um, the uh, renal uh, what really regulates this whole system is renal auto regulatory mechanism now as you can understand that gfr will be under the effect of the the afferent arterial inflow and also all this uh, forces i talked about right so in very brief there will be some cells we told of podocytes there will be some cells beside the podocytes which is known as the mesangial cells with some somewhere around here this this is proximal convoluted tubule loop of henle and then becomes a distal convoluted tubule distal convoluted tubule will have some cells known as the macular densa cells and the afferent arteriole will have some cells which is known as the granulosa cells or granular cells this forms a juxta glomerular apparatus which is controls the renin secretion so renin is a, one of the hormone released from the kidneys what does renin do renin will see if there is less if there is more amount of filtrate within the glomerular space within the proximal convoluted tubule it will activate the angiotensinogen 1 to angiotensin to angiotensin 2 by means of angiotensin uh, angiotensinogen angiotensinogen to angiotensin so what will happens is it will whole renin system will will 
once sick afferent arterioles, so there's, there's less amount of blood going to the glomerulus and less amount of filtration. So this is a renal autoregulatory mechanism. There's another autoregulatory mechanism which we will talk about in the rest later uh, when I'm talking about renal autoregulation. So I think up to this, uh, up to this, you will be more or less having a brief idea of what is renal physiology like. Okay. So thank you. <laughs>